During uh, the rehearsal for her wedding, a nervous bride was having a difficult time remembering all the details, and her kind pastor took her aside uh, at the end of the rehearsal and said, look, my dear, you'll be fine. When you enter the church tomorrow, uh, you'll be walking down the same aisle that you've walked down a few times since you've been part of this church, and particularly tonight, you've been rehearsing how to come down it. So just remember, you know, concentrate, just watch the aisle carefully, you'll be absolutely fine. When you get about halfway down, I just want you to to look at the front, and I want you to see the altar, and just just have in mind that, you know, that's where things are going to change at the altar. Everything is going to be wonderful for you. You're going to be married and become husband and wife, and everything will be fine. Your groom will be there waiting for you. Concentrate on him. Focus. Just get everything You know, take a deep breath, you'll be fine. So she's there thinking to herself, okay, that's fine, seemed to help her, and she seemed a bit calmer. And the beautiful and nervous bride walked away, and the next day, 12 o'clock, she's there. And she walks flawlessly down the aisle. But people were a bit taken aback as they heard her repeating again and again as she came down. The music playing in the background, all you could hear was her going, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. Alex? All right? That'll be our joke at the rehearsal. I'm not sure how much success she had uh, at changing her spouse, but uh, there were probably a number of wives wishing her well that day. I can imagine. Uh, Tonight, uh, I'm not going to be uh, preaching uh, on harvest. I'm going to stick with our Colossians series, because I know some of you are itching to see what on earth we're going to make of this next section. So uh, we're going to carry on and have a look at that. And uh, I I, I guess as you approach the topic that's before us this evening, um, we, we have to just start by saying we come face to face with the reality that if we're serious about following Jesus, he will alter our lives. Because life cannot be the same once you have allowed Christ to come into your life and to be Lord of your life. So if you've got a Bible, why don't you open it up to Colossians? Melissa's going to come and she's going to read this next section for us. Thank you, Matt. This evening's reading is Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 15 and ending at chapter 4, verse 1. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Thanks, Mel. Bless you. So before we jump into this very practical Uh, passage, allow me to make some observations uh, with you. Um, 
Firstly, I want to say this. Our faith has to come home with us. There is a danger that uh, religious people tend to think that faith and the trappings of that faith is something that you kind of do when you're in chapel or when you're in church. And that's not the way this Christianity thing works, I'm afraid. One of the best tests of whether you're a Christian, uh, one of the best tests of your relationship with Jesus is how, in actual fact, you relate to other people and, not least, your family. That's a key area where the test happens. So, you you know, we can be God's chosen people, as Paul says. We can be holy and dearly loved, but how are things at home? Because you can come here with a smile on your face and sing the hymns, but treat your family atrociously. You can come here and hold the position of being the pastor. But in reality, be a terrible husband. And these are serious matters. And so Paul wants to be very practical about, well, okay, you know, if, as he says in chapter 2, Jesus is your Lord, if he really is supreme and sovereign in your life, then that's going to work itself out in your relationships, and that includes very especially your marriage, and if you're blessed to have children, in your parenting. We'll also see that it works itself out in the workplace as well. So, I think we just need to remember that. You know, our faith has to come home with us. The virtues that we spent some time looking at there in verses 12 through 15. You remember when we talked about compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. You know, all of those things have to be fleshed out in our relationships at home. If Jesus is supreme, it should show. And the Colossian church, you remember, had been invaded by a bunch of heretics. And uh, they believed that true spirituality involved a lot of um, mysticism and uh, esoteric knowledge. And Paul's saying, forget that highfalutin nonsense. It's about how you live. You've got to be practical. Is being a Christian making a difference to the way you are as a spouse? Is it making a difference to the way that you raise your kids? Is it making a difference when you're at work? So that's what we're going to explore together uh, this evening. Another interesting thing to note here too, with all that Paul's been banging on about earlier in chapter 2, for instance, about Jesus being supreme over creation and over the church and over those who follow him, it's interesting that Paul refers no less than seven times in this section to Jesus as Lord or Master. So in a very practical day-to-day section, Paul wants us to understand that Jesus' lordship finds its best expression in the day-to-day routine relationships of life. And it's very important we note that before we get our teeth, for instance, into the section on marriage. Because if Jesus is lord of my life and lord of my wife's life, that's the starting point for some of the stuff that Paul's going to talk about next. Where that is not the case, I think it's very, very difficult to be able to put these things into practice. Now, maybe you want to talk to me about that outside of this arena. But uh, I think that's just something, if Paul is so concerned about the lordship of Christ, that's got to be the bedrock on which these things can function. The second thing is, it is about function and not inferiority. As we learnt in Colossians 3.11, Cultural, racial, even gender distinctions are no longer obstacles when it comes to being part of God's family. We're all equal. It's not about whether you're male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free. All that's gone. So let me say from the off, husband and wife are equals before God. Before the cross of Jesus, they are equal. But as we see in a moment, they have different roles. And that's for functional purposes. The same, as we'll see, is true for children and parents. 
third thing I want to say to you is that relationships are meant to be reciprocal. This stuff, we forget, was incredibly radical when it first appeared. I mean, we, you know, we read this stuff today and we think it was a bit dated or old-fashioned or whatever. When this stuff appeared in first century churches, it was radical. There is real concern being expressed in these verses for the most marginalized, ill-treated people of the first century. Who were they? Women, children, and slaves. They were the lowest of the low. Women, children, and slaves. So when Paul talks in this way, it is striking. He's he's naming these three groups. Society and culture denigrated them. But Christianity elevated them. Elevated women, valued children, and set things in motion to sabotage slavery. The fourth thing, families. Families need help today. I'm not going to take time to quote statistics to prove to you what you already know. The family in the United Kingdom, and indeed across the world, is under fire. Home life is disintegrating. And since the very first institution that God founded was relational, uh, family, we need to listen and apply what he's got to say to us in the Bible. And just as he created various physical and natural laws by which the universe functions, so too when God created the family, he gave good guidelines. There's some good stuff in this Bible about being parents and about being kids as well. I wish the kids were here tonight. I tell you, this would be good. So there's good stuff. If we ignore them, I think we do so at our own peril. So I pray now as we come into this passage, we'll engage with it with an open mind to see how Jesus' supremacy subtly deconstructs old habits of domination and exploitation and replaces them with loving leadership and gracious submission. So let's begin with the first of these then, the uh, first of these three relationships. God's guidelines for marriage, very simple here. Uh, I'm the boss, my wife does what I tell her. Let's move on, look at children. I'm the boss, the kids have to toe the line. Thirdly, work. Well, work, I'm a slave to work, and that's it. Okay, let's say the grace. (laughs) There's a bit more there than that, isn't there? The Bible views marriage as a partnership, with each partner fulfilling certain roles. Colossians chapter 3 verse 18 it begins with the duty of wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now let me just say, there's probably no biblical teaching more controversial than that of a wife's submission to her husband. So let's clear up a few things, shall we? So we understand this more accurately, and I'm allowed to do this because Sarah says I am, all right? Nowhere does it say that a wife is to obey her husband. It's interesting, isn't it? In the marriage service, much is made of, is she going to say obey? Well, it's not here. It's not here. Children, look at that. Children, verse 20, obey your parents. Now, the word here is submission, which is very, very different. This has application to wives, as I said, in a marriage relationship, not to women in general. I think it is very properly about a Christian marriage. Um, I'm not in a position to be able to comment about a non-Christian marriage. But I think, you know, it's not about women in general. I think a lot of guys in particular over the years have just thought that women are inferior, should toe the line and do what they're told to do. That's not what this is saying. Both husbands and wives are to submit to the Lord and to each other. Let's put that into context here. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, the concept of submission is taught in many places in the Bible, and it does not mean slavery. 
It does not mean uh, or imply inferiority. And uh, frankly, I've come across Christians over the years. I've come across a lot of preachers uh, who teach this stuff. I've read a lot of books, uh, particularly out of certain uh, stables in America, uh, that really do labor on, you know, this is it. That women should have a nice dress on and uh, do their hair, put some lippy on, get the food on the table when their hard-working man comes home. Well, I've been married 27 years and I'm yet to experience that. (laughs) You'll be glad to know. But that's not what this is teaching. And I don't quite understand why academics in some circles aren't being a bit more truthful to the text and a bit more understanding of culture and of how this passage would have been revolutionary to the context in which it was first read. The Greek word for submission literally means to arrange oneself under a delegated authority. It comes from a military term where soldiers were to be under the direction of the officer. And so you, you, know, you, you have that respect there, and you're both in the same unit or brigade or whatever. You're all going for the same thing, but you recognize this person is the leader. It's similar to what Paul praised the believers for back in Colossians 2, verse 5. I delight to see how orderly you are. And it's interesting, isn't it? The reason for submission is found at the end of verse 18. It's there. You know, wives submit to your husbands. You're trying to put a full stop there. Hang on. As is fitting in the Lord. That's very important. Submission carries the idea of entrusting oneself to the leadership of another to accomplish a task. When a Christian woman is submitted to the Lord, that's where it has to start, then this whole issue about submission in a relationship can work itself out. It is not for one minute about me telling Sarah, you've got to do this because I said so. Tough. I'd get my backside kicked if I said that to her. But there are times, aren't there, in every marriage when you're at an impasse. A decision has to be taken and neither of you want to take it. And it's at those times I have found that headship comes into play. For instance, when we left Milton and I took up a job working for the Baptist Union, And we were clear that the Lord was guiding us and leading us for me to do that. That was fine. Where would we live? Neither of us could decide. Neither of us could be clear about what Sarah applied for a job, didn't get it, uh, down here in South Wales. And then, you know, there were no jobs available. Nothing was coming up. And we were like, well, what, what, what do we do? So I said to her, look, what we'll do is this. We'll, we'll seek the Lord's face about it for a period of time and where you get a job anywhere in Wales, we'll just live there. That'll be fine. If it's across the border in England, we'll, we'll cross the bridge with that. And again, it was very difficult to make a decision. But eventually, I was discerning that it was right for us to be in that mid-Wales region. My boss, I talked to him about it, Peter Thomas, some of you will know him, And he seemed to suggest that being equidistant from everybody made sense. So it's a mutually inconvenient place to live, mid-Wales. So so I said to Sarah, that's what we're going to do. Now, interestingly enough, having both of us submitted to the Lord about this in the first place, she said, okay, that's what you feel. That's what we'll do. There's her submission to me. And then the Lord gave her a job. So it was interesting how things worked out. I don't think this is about, you're the woman, I and my shirts. I think this has been abused over the years for men to get away with murder, quite literally at times. And I think that the submission to the Lord issue is left out. I mean, we're going to see this more and more in a moment. We need an environment in our marriages of intimacy. 
of growth, of partnership. There are some things Sarah does one heck of a lot better than me that you might assume, as the man, I should do. All the electronic gadgetry in our house is programmed and put together by her. I ain't got a clue. I do the shopping. But when important things come up where there's an impasse, Sarah recognizes that I'm the one God has said must give a lead. When there have been important matters to deal with in the children, we try to be a partnership with things, but where there's a decision that then needs to be taken, it falls on me. It's a heck of a responsibility. And before we guys start gloating and posting this verse on your wife's mirror so she can see it in the morning, verse 19, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Throughout the Bible, God says more about the quality of a husband's leadership than he does about a wife's submission. I'll say that again. Throughout the Bible, God says more about the quality of a husband's leadership than he does about a wife's submission. I think that the responsibility for a good marriage is put more on a husband. I have no doubt. Bad marriages are usually the result of a husband's inability to love his wife instead of the wife's refusal to be submissive. I've yet to meet a woman who is married who would not be willing to follow the leadership of a man who loves her unconditionally. That's very important. Because let's explore that for a moment. It helps us to understand verse 18 more. The word husband originally meant one who holds the house together. Another image is that of a gardener who cultivates the soil and keeps the weeds out. As husbands, our responsibility is to love our wives by holding things together and providing an atmosphere for growth and fruitfulness in the home. I heard about a husband who decided to make an appointment with a marriage counsellor because his marriage was on a bit of rocky ground. And his wife was hurt and upset and she began to talk and she crossed her arms and recounted her loveless life and tears filled her eyes and her lips started quivering. It wasn't long before the wise counsellor realised what the problem was. So without saying a word, he took her by the hands, looked her in the eyes for a long time, smiled at her and gave her a great big kiss on the lips. A change immediately came over her face. She softened. Her eyes lit up. Stepping back, the counsellor said to her husband, you see, sir, that's all she needs. The husband checked his diary and said, great, I'll bring her in Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> you know, to, to us husbands here, to us husbands, when's the last time you hugged your wife and took time to listen to her? In a parallel passage in Ephesians 5, Paul devotes twice as many words telling husbands to love their wives as he does to telling wives to submit to their husbands. Ephesians 5.25 tells us we're to love our wives in the same way as Christ loves the church. And how does he love the church? He died for the church. I have to love Sarah to the point of being willing to die for her. And you notice this last part of Colossians 3, verse 19, challenges husbands not to be harsh with their wives. That phrase can be translated, don't become embittered or resentful. Husbands must prevent a sour attitude from taking root. Some marriages are so sour. It's interesting, the only other time that word is used in the New Testament is referring to to, uh, uh, something that's bitter in taste. Paul is telling husbands, don't call them honey and behave like vinegar. You you need to be sensible here. It's very practical teaching. So we're not taking it out of context. We're putting it in context. We're not just dealing with it in isolation. We're understanding it in the whole remit of Scripture. And I think, fellas, those of us who are married, It is incumbent upon us to love our wives as Christ loves the church if we're going to see these things happening. Now, you notice next that Paul uh, addresses the relationship between children and parents. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Kids have a duty to listen and carry out the instructions of their parents. I think a lot of parents, including Christian parents, sadly today, 
have walked away from this responsibility of telling their kids what is uh, doable and not doable, what is permitted and what is not permitted. And it's a sad state of affairs. I don't know why we've gotten like that, uh, watching people trying to reason with a two-year-old when actually they just need jolly well to be told. I think the naughty step is a great invention. It's a lot better than Prenna Flatley. You don't know what that is. Do you remember the Flatley errors? Yes. And they had wooden sticks in them. Yeah, if I didn't do what I was told, that's what I used to get. Don't report my mother to social services. She's 83, bless her. And she do love me. Kids should do what they're told. I know we say, oh yes, you know, but it's very difficult, isn't it? And I know we don't want to break, you know, the, 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 the spirit. You know, we, we want to mold the will and everything. But I think as parents, we do have a responsibility to say to our kids, No. I don't know what you feel about this. As grandparents, some of you, or great-grandparents, I know it's hard. My kids are in their 20s. I still find it hard to say no, but as many of you will attest, even as they get older, you still have to say to them, I don't think that's a good idea, because I'm still their dad. The verb here is very interesting. It's in the present tense. It indicates that such action is habitual, and ongoing, when a child obeys his or her parents, uh, God is pleased. It pleases the Lord. I would love to have the kids here tonight, because I'd love to ask them what they think pleases God. It's an interesting discussion to have with young people. I've done some teaching on this when I've run youth camps. And just to find out, you know, because very often, teenage rebellion in particular is something we've all been there. Blinking like I rebelled. Some of you are in your 90s and you're still rebelling, Trevor, do you, mate? You know? But, you know. Now, 1 Samuel 15, God puts rebellion on a part with, with witchcraft and idolatry. The ramifications of disobedience and the blessings of obedience, it means that parents have to take seriously the task of training children to obey. I know you, as they get older, it, you, want, you have to let them fly. They make their own mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are very costly. And you have to be there for them and love them and reassure them, hey, I've been there myself. I know some of you are going through this in particular at the moment. But I think when they're much younger, I just the advice I would want to give to, to those getting married and to those who are young new parents, set boundaries. Be clear in your household what is acceptable and what isn't. So I didn't have debates with my kids. Have you ever had this one? Time to go to bed now. Five minutes later. I thought I said it was time to go to bed. And it just carries on and on and on. And I was challenged about this as a young father. And it got to the stage where it was just ridiculous. And so eventually, it was, it's time for bed now. Now, no tidying up toys, no sorting things out, no, can I watch the last five, no, now. And that's a tough place. But I think it's about sticking to things that you mean. If you mean it, stick to it. Colossians 3.21 gives fathers again. See, guys, I'm sorry, but biblically, it, it falls on us. It gives us an awesome responsibility. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they'll become discouraged. When's the last time we heard any teaching on this stuff? See, this is the problem with series preaching. You can't avoid this sort of stuff. In the Old Testament, Joshua was strong in his resolve for his family to serve the Lord. Eli, on the other hand, do you remember? He's condemned because of his failure to restrain his boys. His sons are off doing no good. Paul used the word fathers here to show the strategic role that dads play in parenting. The Greek word certainly includes mothers as well. I think one reason he does specify the role of the father, though, is because dads have a propensity to muck things up. I don't know how you other guys feel about this who are dads, but I've thought long and hard, but I think we do. I think this, and Paul knew that. 
Don't embitter your children, he says. And that's addressed chiefly to fathers. The, the, the kids will become discouraged. In Paul's day, the father was more like a dictator than a daddy. I dare say some of you older people here will have grown up maybe in a similar relationship to that, where perhaps there wasn't much kuching and, and cuddling and stuff, and maybe dad was a, a rather austere figure. But the problem with us dads is that very often we struggle in our relationships with our kids because I think we're prone to do four things. One is ignore them. A father, you know, will often, I mean, gosh, I, I, let me put my hands up now. I have done that with my kids. I had no time for them. Burning the candle both ends. Feeling that I'm indispensable in the Lord's work. Now that, ooh, I tell you, I meet lots of children from the manse. And they can be very resent, resentful towards their parents. Children can grow up to feel unloved and unaccepted and can end up looking elsewhere to have their needs met if we don't give them time. I think we have to give our kids time. The other thing we are prone to do is to indulge our kids. You know, giving our kids every... Christmas is coming, blinking heck. You know, they watch it, I want this, I want that. Well, I want doesn't get. Is that an old-fashioned idea? I don't know. If you indulge a child all the time, they can become restless and dissatisfied and thoroughly spoiled. I think a third thing we often do is that we insult them. I'm appalled when I'm with people at times about how dads criticize their kids or even call them names. You teachers here, you'll know about this. Fathers and mothers using sarcasm to ridicule their children. It can knock the stuffing out of a child faster than anything else. And I think the other thing that sometimes happens, sadly, with fathers, is that they intimidate their kids, making threats and having unfair expectations. It's okay to encourage your kids at school, isn't it? But blinking heck, some of the things that are said today, I mean, you can fillet a child's self-esteem and scar her for life. Those of us who are dads have to make it as easy as possible for our kids to obey. Ephesians 6, verse 4, puts it this way. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. He said, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So here's a simple question to us dads. Am I partnering with God to enable my children to become the men and women he intends them to be? Do they know how delighted and, I, and excited I am about them? Do they feel like they're on, the, on their side? Am I living under the leadership of Jesus in my life so that my children will have a model to follow? Well, I hope so. Okay. We doing all right? Okay. Verse 22. What time is it? Oh, my bread's starting to get stale. Right. Let's see. Verse 22. Come to some teaching on slaves and their masters. Uh, first century, most homes had a slave. Okay, that's the way it was, you know. Uh, the Colossian church, no doubt, had slaves and slave owners in the same church. In fact, it was probably the only place in society at that time that you would get a slave owner and a slave on the same level. Wow, that's radical. In a society that was governed by those who were in charge and those who were inferior, in church, they were equal. That's amazing. No racial distinction, no class distinction. A couple of things to keep uh, in, in your mind as you look at this little section. At the time of Paul's writing, almost 50% of the inhabitants of the Roman Empire were slaves. It's important to know that slavery wasn't a racial issue in the Roman world like it was in our country many years ago. Slaves were usually uh, defeated military personnel. And while Paul didn't call believers to overturn the institution of slavery, these verses helped to bring about a real change from the inside. That you know that the Roman Empire ultimately lost its commitment to slavery as the gospel in particular penetrated further and further into the culture and more and more masters and slaves started treating it other, each other like brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Now, we need to look at this section. I, I think what I want to try and do with you is, is try and see how this might affect us in our works, uh, work situation, in the workplace. Because I think this is a great little section for us to apply, uh, to apply to our jobs. It might just work fine for some of you, mind, because you feel you're a slave to your work anyway, but there we go. If you look at verses 22 through to 25... You know, slaves obey your earthly masters and everything. So, you know, imagine yourself at work now. Do it uh, not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance uh, from the Lord as a reward. Uh, It is the Lord you're, you're serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for wrong. And there's no favoritism. In other words, do your best at your job all the time. Okay, where to work hard, not just when the boss is around, even when he isn't. Years ago, a missionary was responsible for getting the nationals to do certain jobs, and he was frustrated because they were lazy and only worked when he was actually watching them. I think this is a true story, by the way. And when he left, they would stop their jobs, just sit around and not do anything. And this man had a glass eye, and one day it was irritating him, so he took it out. And... uh, he went out of the room, and when he came back, everybody was blinking, working hard. And why? Because they thought the eye was on them. The missionary wasn't so thrilled that one day, because he, he thought this was a great idea, so he left the eye there all the time. And uh, he wasn't too thrilled that when he came back one day, and there was a hat over the top of it. <laughs> but that's what Paul is saying here, isn't it? Don't just do your job well when people are looking. Do a good job when nobody's looking. I think also here we see worship at work. Have you ever thought about that? It doesn't mean you hold a worship service at your company, okay? Instead, it means you work out of reverence for the Lord. Properly understood, your job, no matter what it is, can be an act of worship. You can go on to the ward. You can stand doing what you're doing on the, the, uh, the factory floor. You can do the administration as unto the Lord as an act of worship. I think sometimes we get the, all of this backwards. Look to our jobs to provide us with meaning and significance. Instead of looking for meaning in your career, friend, bring meaning to it uh, with an attitude of worship. And I think, what else is Paul saying here? Recognize Jesus as your boss, not just the guy who pays you. If you are submitted to Jesus, we've got to come back to that again and again. If Jesus is your master, then serve him in your job. Don't be sloppy or unethical. Look at, look at what Paul says here. Do it as if for the Lord. You've got to have reverence for the Lord. You, you're working for the Lord, not for men. You'll receive an inheritance as a reward. It's Christ you're serving. Your employer may well pay your salary, yeah, but it's the Lord for whom you're really working. Do your job to God's honor. And then you've got this whole thing in chapter 4, verse 1, which which we're going to finish with. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. That's the challenge for employers. So important. Masters aren't free to set their own standards and how to treat their slaves. They've got to do what's right and fair. So many Christian companies are thinking, thank goodness, about ethical conditions for their workers, are thinking about uh, how much they are paying their employees. These things are key in our world. It was revolutionary of Paul to tell masters to care, uh, to care about the treatment of slaves. Nobody said things like that. Nobody bothered with it. If slave owners were to treat their slaves with integrity, then bosses today have to treat their employees with integrity. If you've got people working for you, it's important to deal fairly with them, just like God treats you. So where do we go from here as we pull all of this together to finish tonight? I think husbands have to love their wives like Jesus loves the church. You like the cartoon? Jesus was willing to die for the church. Submission doesn't mean kowtowing to every whim or desire of the husband. But God has ordained it that in a Christian marriage, the man is the leader. And men, we cannot duck it. At times, it will fall on us 
to make decisions. So it's about leadership. When I, as a husband, determine to love my wife as Christ loves the church, I will make it much easier for my wife to submit to my loving leadership. If you want to talk about that with me and say you're not happy with it, let's have that discussion. I think in family life, we've got to determine today the steps that we need to take, whether you're a parent or a child. And I think that's an interesting one. Because if you have an aged parent, how do you behave towards them? Obviously, I knew I was preaching on this tonight, and I went to see my mother yesterday. You know, she's nearly blind. She doesn't hear very well. She's dodgery on her pins. And at times, I get exasperated with her. And I was very conscious that I was going to be saying, you know, you have to obey your parents in everything if it pleases the Lord. And I thought, how can I honour that scripture in my life with my relationship with my mother? The things for me as an adult child, as much as it is for a young child. And as I said, if there were kids here tonight, I'd be telling them to practice first-time obedience. When mum or dad asks you to do something, don't start whinging. Don't start trying to uh, negotiate. Do it. And for us parents, you know, I don't know. Have you ever asked your child what exasperates you? So I'll do that when I go home tonight with Catherine. Hello, darling, how are you? What exasperates you about me? <sighs> she probably, probably have a list, that's the problem. Final thing, work. It's not too late to bring Jesus to work with you. If you're an employee, try to picture Jesus in your office or stood with you on the factory floor or stood by you as you're doing your job. I, I just, I think that could really revolutionize the way we are at work. Why don't we pray for our bosses? Do we pray blessing on them? If you're an employer, do we pray for our employees? Look, everything we do in marriage, in the family, in the workplace has got to be done in recognition that we have a master over us. As such, our attitude should always be to please him whether it's through submitting or loving, obeying, encouraging, working or supervising, our master will reward us for our service to him. And we come back to the Colossian question. If Jesus is supreme in your life, if he is, then he will alter you. And that will affect your role as a Christian husband, your role as a Christian wife, your role as Christian parents, and your attitude to your work in the workplace. It's an incredibly practical section of Scripture. And I've really enjoyed studying it. And I hope you have as well. We're going to finish. Uh, I want my harvest supper. So, we're going to sing a beautiful...